Good morning and welcome to the standing committee meeting for Wednesday, December 2nd, 2020. Um, our budget hearings will continue virtually this afternoon at 1.30 p.m. with the Departments of Finance and Law and will also include the Ethics Board. Our first order of business is public comment. I would like to remind all speakers that the rules of council state comments are limited to matters of concern, official action or deliberation, which are or may be before city council and profanity will not be permitted. Um, you will be given three minutes to speak after you give your name and neighborhood for the record. Our first speaker is Shaman Pomai. Is Shaman Pomai with us? I don't see it. Our next speaker is Aikuhana Haumalkina. Greetings of peace, light, and love. My title is Aikuhana Haumalkina. Grand Inca of the Aeroflot Confederacy of Aboriginal American People. I would like to continue my sentiments from yesterday. And it's a story that's near and dear to my heart as I have a paternal father who grew up in the foster care system. And I wanted to talk about the lost and forgotten foster children. In the United States, there's an estimated 400 to 500,000 children in foster care. And in Pennsylvania alone, there is 15 to 16,000 children affected by the foster care system. It is of great importance to factor in these forgotten children who are housed in a system and the system has the opportunity to have an impact on these children between the ages of newborn and 21 because after they turn 21 they max out of the system and are forced to become adults when their childhood were stolen and taken away from them. These children then either become incarcerated because of the hurt and the pain that they have felt of being rejected from the very start of their young lives. I would employ that city council can do something about this as funds are available and allocated to these children already and they can be taught trades at an early age so they are able to be contributors to society in a positive manner. And so we are willing to do some of that work to positively impact these youth and these children because I know that pain directly for I've never met my grandmother or my grandfather on my father's side. And that has left a hole in my heart. And I want to begin to repair these hearts because these children matter, their lives matter in this equation while we're looking to positively impact communities and avoid crime and change the crime rate, let's start with the youth. Let's focus on the youth to turn it around and be the change we wish to see in the world. Will you join me? Will you do what is necessary to have a positive impact in these children who've already faced adversity at such a young age? Do the right thing. Make their lives matter. Allocate funds to make sure their lives matter. They didn't ask for this destiny. And so they need someone who cares. Someone who really, really cares about them. If not. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kota Kibe. Greetings, greetings. I'm Cody Bay, 
president of the Iroquois Confederacy Aboriginal American people. And I'm here today <clears throat> to discuss um, our rights and make those known to members of city council and how Aboriginal American people have, are being treated here in America and particularly around the area known as Pittsburgh. And as Aboriginal people, so-called Indians of our land, uh, we have a right to our own identity. We have a right to our traditions, customs, and systems belonging to each of our nation states and peoples. And no discrimination of any kind may arise from the exercise of such of that right. However, what we are experiencing here in America is the wanton violation of our rights and no accountability for those violations, such as our judicial personality is constantly being violated. And according to the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Constitution, states must fully recognize our juridical personality of our people, respecting our forms of organization, government, and the full exercise of rights recognized in both declarations, constitutions, and international bodies of law, and a lot of law enforcement officials and state officials and, and, and private organizations and entities seem not to, not to get that picture that they are indeed visitors in our land. And our people have a right to reject the assimilation that has been plagued upon our people by uh, colonizers and different people, foreigners coming to our land and policy makers. And our people, according to Article 10, we have the right to reject assimilation as well as uh, 18 U.S.C. 1091, which deals with genocide. And our people have a right to maintain and express and freely develop our cultural integrity and in all respects free from any external attempt by the state or any agencies or commercial entities at that assimilation. States and entities and cities and municipalities shall not carry out, adopt, support, or favor any type of policy, the lawmaking, the statutes, the codes, or ordinances that forcefully assimilates our people and destroy our culture just to put us in your system. So we have to be protected against that genocide and we have a right as Article 11 states not to be the object of any form of genocide or any attempts to assimilate or exterminate us. And this is why we need to have a more open dialogue with city council members, chiefs of police and everybody in charge because our people are being violated. Our rights are being violated even when we give proper notice to those entities whether it be a stop on the side of the street and tell those officers and people that, hey, we're Aborigines and they want to throw that under the, uh, throw us under the bus and want to assimilate us. So there's some serious, serious crimes going on and we must address those and it must be addressed with, with everybody. So we need to start some programs and get. Thank you. Um, we will now go back to our first speaker, um, Shaman Pomai. I'm being patient because it says it's, they're connecting to audio. Shaman Pomai. Okay, while we wait for them to be able to connect, let's try to go on to our next speaker, which is Alicia Salvadeo. Hi, yeah, this is the first council meeting I've been able to attend in a while because my job normally keeps me from participating. That's why first off, um, I'm urging you to open up budget hearings to 
um, the public and public comment and to schedule a special meeting on an evening like December 8th so more working people can participate. I know a lot of people would like to engage directly with the council on the city budget um, and speak to you specifically about the need for things like social housing, health care, in particular mental health care, child care, and uh, jobs programs. I think the council should consider canceling all of the cuts um, that are slated for this budget, with the exception of what this uh, administration has consistently prioritized, and that's the police. Um, I was in Pittsburgh before this mayor, before uh, the police force had uh, an extra 50% to their budget, so I know for a fact that cutting back will not be a disaster for the city. Um, we should start with cutting um, those cops who have records of abuse. Um, it's shocking that people like Paul Abel are allowed to remain employed with so many um, uh, complaints against them for abuse. Um, then you can look at the hundreds of cops who are up to retirement, which as the paternal order of police threatened, were more than willing to retire um, back in August, um, facing calls for public accountability. Um, I think it's incredibly important as a teacher with, you know, I've just spent um, a semester teaching uh, my students remotely. I have a literal window into their lives. Um, so you can trust that I know what we need desperately right now. It's not a thousand cops on the street. It's sending a message to our kids that it's more important to keep roofs over their heads um, and knowing that their communities are not gonna be destroyed by development, um, big development, um, by evictions and so on. Um, so it's incredibly important that not only you um, defund the police by at least 50%, but also find funding. We're heading into a bigger budget crisis next year. So now is the time to show political leadership, tax big business, tax the, the big developers, and also urge the city to take up a um, lawsuit against UPMC, which has stood in the way, ironically, of the survival of our communities. Um, we have to make up for not only the shortfall, but actually fund the things that we need. And I have a lot of students and I have a lot of friends who do not have the housing that they need and are denied it, that cannot afford health care, that are not paid decent wages by UPMC. Um, finally, if I have time, I've been canvassing um, with Stop the Station in East Liberty and have spoken with hundreds of people who are against um, the Zone 5 police station moving to that neighborhood. Um, so I urge you, I know we're talking about the operating budget now, but uh, vote down any um, funds for capital police related capital projects, including that relocation, um, and spend that towards uh, permanently affordable social housing. Um, Thank you very much. Um, we will now try to go back to Shoman Pomai. Greetings, greetings. In La Ke Alakain, I greet you in the words of my ancestors, the light in the honors, the light in you all. Uh, just to continue the conversation um, that I've had in the past, or the or what I've said in the past regarding police um, in and in the in a, the non-accountability of the city to control their police officers as it relates to the Aborigine Americans on our own land. Now, I've had multiple conversations about this. The Office of Municipal Investigations is also involved in this situation at this time as I was assaulted by police officers. I was accosted. I was a, a forced assimilated and my automobile was stolen and towed. I was treated as a citizen. I am not a citizen of the United States. I am not one of your property. I am not one of your chattel. What I am is an Aborigine American Indian and what I am Indian not taxed to be more specific. And, and we have a government to government agreement with Congress. And it seems to me that city council has no respect for the oath that they took to the constitution, you would not be here on our lands were it not for this constitution. So I am imploring you, I've sent correspondence to each one of you city council persons, and I've sent correspondence to the mayor's office. This is going to be addressed and it is not gonna be swept away. I am not going away. They have my automobile stolen at McCannon Chester, which is also an entity that has no legitimacy over the Aborigine American peoples. So they are overstepping their constitutional boundaries. They are also citizens of the United States. All companies are considered citizens under the United States. There are codes that you must follow. 
along with the constitution, the highest law in the land. So I am imploring all of you to check your emails and you'll be receiving more correspondence for this will not stop until I am made whole, my automobile is returned to me and I will not be extorted because this is the attempt that they're making, an attempt to extort me for Federal Reserve notes. There is no money in this economy. There is no money. Federal Reserve notes is fiat currency. It's a promissory note. And is a promise ever going to pay a debt? And I say no. So please look forward to the correspondence. And I expect out of your due diligence and your honoring and your oath of the Constitution that we will move forward to right this wrong. I have been made unjust by the city of Pittsburgh police. And I yield. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chloe Brown. Hi, my name is Chloe Brown. I live in District 5. Um, I will start by reading some statements that I received from residents a few weeks ago while canvassing in Garfield, just a few blocks from where the Zone 5 police station is slated to be relocated. I will keep their names anonymous so as to respect their privacy. $3 million to move a station a mile and a half shows that there's no priority for the people that actually live here. I think the city should be moving that money from the police department's budget and reinvesting it where it's appropriate in actual assets that people use to survive. This one from a mother. In our community nowadays, we should be spending our money on things that are going to help our children instead of harming them. Relocating a police station to me doesn't seem very useful to the community. I'd like them to use that $3 million for education, for affordable housing, for things that are going to help, like rebuilding our rec centers, redoing our parks. You could do anything with that $3 million other than relocating a bunch of police officers who barely even help us. The overwhelming sentiment among nearly every East Liberty and Garfield resident that I spoke with while canvassing for Stop the Station was one, confusion that they had not heard about the city's plan to move the police station back to their neighborhood, and two, a desire for money to be taken from the police budget and reinvested into social services and community development. In fact, 66% of the people we have talked to are in support of stopping this move and reinvesting the money into the community instead. It gets very frustrating when departments like emergency medical services, the Office of Equity, Transportation, Fire, all have their budgets cut when these are necessary things for community support and safety. The police, whose budget remains intact, save for a few crossing guards, are not necessary for these purposes. In fact, the department and Councilperson O'Connor himself have reassured us that even with 100 officers quarantining, response times did not drop at all. This just proves how overstaffed and overfunded our police force is. Stop claiming that you have not heard from the people about these issues. I should not have to be out risking my life in a pandemic to canvas and get these statements, but I'm willing to to get the people's voices heard. And based on what I and now you have heard from residents, I would like to request that the council votes to reallocate the funds for the renovation of the planned police station to instead renovating the Zone 5 fire station into a community center or social service focused building in order to best address the needs of the community. And in the grander scheme of things, a large amount of police funding must be reallocated to endeavors like this throughout the city. Police do not help communities. They do not stop crime. Reducing poverty and increasing social support is what makes neighborhoods safer. And Pittsburgh must start prioritizing that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Corey Buckner. Good morning, uh, members of council. Uh, my name is Corey Buckner. I am the Western PA political coordinator for SEIU 32BJ. As many of you know, we are the largest property service union in the country. We represent more than 175,000 members along the Eastern Seaboard. And in Western PA, we represent over 6,400 commercial office cleaners, security guards, school and university workers in our region. We wanna thank the mayor's office for introducing measures to implement emergency COVID-19 paid sick days. We also wanna thank council president, Teresa Kell Smith for moving this agenda quicker and for the members of council for uh, addressing this today. We are now seeing the greatest spike in positive cases of COVID. And since the beginning of the pandemic, SEIU has been instrumental in pushing for frontline worker protections locally in states, and federally. 32BJ worked closely with members of Congress to craft the Family First Coronavirus Response Act and the CARES Act, 
which is soon to expire at the end of the month, leaving millions of workers without paid sick day protections. But most important, what the act does not provide is paid sick days to workers of the nation's largest employers of 500 or more workers. We have witnessed many of our own members contract the virus and far too many have died from it in our union. What's troubling is that many of those cases happened earlier in the year. We are heading into a second wave of this deadly pandemic and workers on the front line cannot afford government to cut them short. Our members are constantly at risk of being exposed and many of them have been exposed here in Pittsburgh. Though, we did not, though they did not connect, contract the virus, they have been forced to quarantine and some have quarantined more than once without pay. This is unacceptable considering that they work for multi-million and billion dollar corporations. It's time for the private sector to take ownership in protecting families during this pandemic instead of taking advantage of the opportunity to gain wealth. More than ever before, the city of Pittsburgh has to take care of its residents as we navigate through the second wave of the pandemic. We must ensure that the people uh, come before profit and each and every worker has the opportunity to take care of themselves and their family. I appreciate your attention and I hope you all will consider supporting emergency paid sick days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next registered speaker is Mr. Sam Williamson. not see Mr. Williamson. Our next speaker is Christopher Juring. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm gonna be reading for somebody else who couldn't make it today. Um, so here we go. My name is Daniel Sun. I live in Bloomfield, zip code 15224. I'm with the Stop the Station Coalition. I wish to submit a public comment for Wednesday's city council meeting. I'm unable to deliver this statement in person because I have a work meeting scheduled at 10 a.m. I'm asking city council to create a separate budget post agenda meeting that takes place outside of work hours and to open up all the departmental budget hearings to public comment for this budget season and for subsequent budget seasons. The 2021 operating budget and capital budgets set forth by the mayor are undemocratic and did not reflect the needs of the people. I don't know how you can believe that this budget comes close to addressing reality. We are in the middle of a pandemic with record unemployment and with people falling behind on rent, scared to lose their homes. We had a historically unprecedented number of people in the streets this summer protesting the police with calls to defund the police. How can you come back with a budget that offers no additional assistance to renters, no additional medical coverage, and the bare minimum lip service reforms to the police? Has anyone in the mayor's office done any kind of analysis or simulation into how this budget is going to actually affect people? Because I would bet we're going to get 2020 all over again. It's clear this budget was made without people in mind because they didn't ask us for our opinion. The mayor's office used a terribly sparse survey in September and October that no one heard of or remembers because there were barely any mentions of this survey online. Stop the Station hosted a budget hearing and invited the members of this council and the mayor to attend so that we can have a heart to heart about the budget, but none of you all came. Now our only way to provide input is through these city council meetings that take place at 10 a.m. during work hours. Literally, I am not here because of a work meeting. This 2021 budget is one of the most important budgets to be passed in almost a decade. And instead of opening up public input and democracy, we are met with the opposite. We are forced to, mat to watch while an incompetent mayor ignores the most important issues facing our city with a budget that is just a repeat of the last five years. However, I believe the people of Pittsburgh have good ideas and we know what we need. That is why I'm asking City Council to create a separate budget post agenda meeting that takes place outside of work hours. I'm also asking that we open up all departmental budget hearings to public comment as people deserve to know the various city departments uh, are using our tax dollars. And lastly, I ask that these meetings are created every year because this budget is an important issue that people have the right to discuss. I should not have to come here to beg for something so obvious. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, 
that has exhausted our registered speakers list. Um, we will now move on to our standing committee agenda. Will the clerk please take the roll? Reverend Burgess. Here. Mr. Coghill. Here. Ms. Gross. Here. Mr. Krause. Here. Mr. O'Connor. Here. Mrs. Kel Smith. Here. Ms. Strasberger. Here. Mr. Wilson. Here. Mr. Lavelle Chair. Here. Nine members present. Thank you. Our, our first committee of the day is Finance and Law, which is chaired by myself. Um, first new paper is Bill 921. Bill 921, resolution providing the sale of certain property acquired by the City of Pittsburgh at tax sale, items A through C, Zero Faust, Zero Province, 926 Morrison. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Bill 922. Bill 922, resolution providing for the conveyance by the city of certain property having been placed for sale to adjourning property owners in conjunction with the city of Pittsburgh side yard program, item A through G, 855 Inwood, 1123 Morrison, 540 McClinton, 629 Chukrana, 1621 Marquez, and 2037 in Zero Bright Ridge. Need a motion. motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Bill 927. Bill 927, an ordinance providing for special conditions for the operation and use of paid sick under the paid sick days act during and due to the crisis presented by COVID-19 through inclusion in the Pittsburgh Code of Ordinances of Chapter 626A, Temporary Emergency COVID-19 Paid Sick Conditions. Uh, motion to approve with discussion. Second. Discussion, Councilman Cross. Yeah, thank you. Uh, who's here from the administration, please? So can I also mention something, Councilman Cross? Of course. Uh, I'm sorry, I suggested that we, since we're having the post agenda on Monday, that maybe the administration could come on Monday with SEIU, SEI, I already talked to Sam Williamson, he'll be there, and okay. um, and uh, it, some people from the business community. But if members want to have discussion now, they can do that now too. I mean, so I, was uh, to, I figured sure. we're gonna have the conversation Monday too, that's all. So Madam President, what then, uh, what then is your pleasure as far as, uh, um, Advancing the bill today, are we holding for post agenda? No, no, we were going to vote preliminary today and then um, have the post agenda Monday and final vote Tuesday. But I think members, other members are messaging me that they have questions. So I, they might want to ask their questions first. I just have a couple, although, and then, but that's going to open it up to discussion. So, the, I mean, it, it's up to you. I prefer that we wait until Monday, but if members want to, that's up to the members. Um, if they want to speak up and say whether they, or not they want to wait till Monday or ask their questions today. That's up to them. Okay. Councilman Cross still has the floor. So uh, uh, <laughs> uh, if I ask questions, are other members gonna ask questions? Do you wanna raise your hands? Are we gonna open discussion or should we just respect the sponsor's wishes and save them till Monday? I'm for that. <sighs> Corey, you too? I mean, I, I, I just got a text. I mean, I know it's Councilwoman Smith's bill or sponsorship. I just, there's a couple of questions that I think we need an executive session for. Not that I need to hold the bill, but I think we should set that up to just, I need to hear from law. Not, uh, uh, and I don't, I know we're having an, uh, a conversation, but you know, the law department I'd like to just have an executive session with them just to make sure that the bill that we all fought for for five years is not in jeopardy at all. And then also, I mean, if this is coming up Monday, which is fine, just the implementation of it. So I can email my questions, but I, I think we should try to get law in a room ASAP with council before the end of the week. So could I offer this up then please? 
how about if we hold the bill for executive session and post agenda? We could recess this meeting. We could take both actions on Tuesday. We could come back, offer preliminary and final as well. So as to give opportunity for members to, uh, to ask the questions on the bill um, and uh, not delayed in any way um, subsequent to some final action. Would that be acceptable to members? Uh, Chief of Staff Gilman just logged on. So maybe he can address some of the questions. I'll be happy to, to defer if everybody's okay. Hi, Chief. Good morning, members. How are you? Good, thank you. Uh, I, I only heard the very, very end of Councilman O'Connor, so I, I apologize. I didn't hear any questions uh, that I can answer to, to your point, uh, Councilman Krauss, about uh, recessing. Obviously, that, that's fully up to Council. I, it's not a position for the administration to take. Um, sure. but I apologize. I didn't hear Councilman O'Connor's uh, questions, if there was one for me. The, the uh, how, I'm just afraid that if we start with questions and we open discussion and we're going to have the discussion today, um, as opposed to in deference to Councilwoman Kale Smith and out of respect for her being the sponsor of the bill and the fact that we do have an a, I'm sorry, a um, uh, post agenda scheduled for Monday. Would it be prudent then for us to also hold for executive session? So as there are some questions members have about making sure we don't jeopardize uh, paid sick leave as it exists today in any way um, and um, have our questions answered by law, host a post agenda to have a, a fulsome public discussion um, and recess the meeting, still be able to bring it up on Tuesday uh, to preliminarily vote and final vote without uh, jeopardizing uh, the um, completion of the bill in any way. Madam President, how do you feel about that? So I think it sounds like a good solution, but I, I'm okay voting preliminary today, holding the executive session Monday, holding the post agenda Monday and final vote on Tuesday. I'm okay with that too. So Council, Councilman Krause. I'll defer. Okay, so technically Councilman Krause still has the floor, although he was having an inter interrogatory with a number of members. Um, so the motion is to approve. We're in discussion. I believe Councilwoman Strasberger wanted to go. Yes, and I uh, won't yeah, ask, yeah. I won't ask any I'm questions. Happy. Hello? I'm sorry, I'll defer, I'm happy to. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I won't ask any questions. I just wanted to note for anyone who is, has been, is watching this bill and is concerned about it, who is not on city council that it's my understanding that even if we're voting preliminarily today, that, the, that there are amendments and some changes in the works so that people understand that and that there still will be room for amendments prior to final vote. That is, that is my understanding as well, Councilwoman. Um, there's an urgency to, to move this. Um, as previously noted, the federal bill expires this month. Um, which is why we want to move this along. Are there, is there any other comments from members? Councilman Coghill? Yes, I just want to make sure, what does this bill have to do with our original paid sick leave? <clears throat> no correlation, right? Yeah. No. It can, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yeah, yes, Chief Gilman. It's certainly, I, I'm not a lawyer and I think that is an important question. Uh, as Councilman O'Connor noted, to ask law department executive session, uh, I wouldn't want to give you any legal assurance, but I can tell you we worked with law to very intentionally not add it as sections of the existing bill for that very reason. So that if there was a legal challenge to this or an issue with this, it would be fully separate from the existing law, which you know council members worked so hard to. Uh, so there is a very intentional effort to keep them separate. Got it. Thank you. Mr. Chair, may I? Thank you, Councilman Gross. <clears throat> um, Chief Gilman, this, we've had about a five minute discussion with no one actually talking about the bill. Could, could you just maybe for the public, there's been media, if there's an article in the Post-Gazette, but could you maybe just, so the public isn't very confused, just give a brief description. Um, and that's, sure. that's all I have. Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. And I will also, as, as Councilman Strasser met, 
Uh, we are working on a number of amendments that have been raised by people on all sides of the issue, uh, and I'll work to get council a, a new clean version ASAP. Uh, there's also some technical things law has done, like uh, capitalizing the E and employer and employee because they're definitions. So there's a, a whole list of things, and, and I will get that and make sure that's publicly available. The intent uh, of this law is that as we see increasing numbers of COVID cases in the city of Pittsburgh, employees that are either positive or exposed to uh, the virus have an opportunity to have paid sick leave. Uh, and the prime example I I've given is somebody who works um, in, an, in an environment, uh, another colleague has tested positive, the health department or their employer has said, you know, Jane or John Doe, you can't work for the next 10 days, you have to go home and quarantine uh, and you won't be paid because you're not working. For those people, that is their lifeline to food on the table for their kids, for a roof over their head, their mortgage, their apartment, their bills. Uh, and for now, what is an increasing daily number of city residents, uh, it is putting their very livelihood uh, in jeopardy. Uh, others have said there's already paid sick leave. Why do you, why do you need this? Uh, and our argument on that would be, if somebody has to use all of their time in January because of COVID, we get a vaccine and hopefully are back to some semblance of normal sometime in 2021. They don't have any sick leave days left for the entire year. And we pass sick leave for a reason. And that is because of flu, because your child gets sick, all the reasons council members voted for it, they wouldn't have it. So we really see a need to have a separate emergency COVID sick leave that provides the opportunity for, for residents of the city who are ordered out of work by the health department or by their employer uh, or appropriate public health agency to have the financial support uh, to not risk um, uh, not being able to, to make key payments or the opposite, which is they hide symptoms, they hide information because, and then go to work because they need that paycheck and they spread the virus and, and create a fatal situation. So I could just summarize. Paid sick leave was the policy we needed for normal times. Absolutely. We are not in normal times. And so we have an emergency um, time bill to, to, to serve the public for these emergency times. Um, and so I think I'm, I'm, I really appreciate the work on this. Um, it, what I heard was council members, you know, we're all trying to make sure it works. So exactly. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members um, still on first round? Mr. Chair. Councilman Burgess. Sure, I, I support the bill 100%. Um, I do find it curious that members who don't believe in the authority of the law department want to talk to law about this case when they've already said that they don't believe what law says. I just find that somewhat hypocritical and curious. But I do support this bill. Thank you. Councilman O'Connor. Yes, I just want to clarify. I, I am just worried that, and this is why I want to listen to the law department, that by doing this and amending the bill, which basically gives us the right to do this that we all voted for years ago, that it doesn't jeopardize uh, the bill that gave 40,000 individuals the right to paid sick leave because we were told by the law department that if we amended the actual bill, that those individuals that didn't believe in sick leave would take us to court. And I don't wanna jeopardize what we already won. So again, as you mentioned, Rev, I don't care about the law department, but I do know that they know a little bit more about the legal ease than I do to the fact that if we change something technical in the code, does that open the bill back up to be challenged and therefore the 40,000 people that we all voted for might lose that initiative. That's the only reason why I want some executive session just so I can hear that it doesn't jeopardize that, which I don't believe it does, but I would just like to hear from somebody in that realm to clarify that so that we can move this bill forward. I have no problem going forward today. That was just the technical question that I had. And this is, possibly a new bill, but we wouldn't have had this bill unless we passed the original bill. So that's why this bill piggybacks off all of what we did five years ago. Thank you. 
Um, still on first round. Any other members? Second round, Councilman Coghill. Yes. So, am I to understand this is only COVID related? Meaning, if you're forced to stay home because you're quarantined, or you have it, is that right? That that is correct, Councilman. It 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 is only tied specifically to COVID, uh, and it would expire currently. The bill before you says four weeks after the governor's uh, order expires, we actually plan to amend that to make it one week after some consultation uh, with law and other people. Uh, but it, it is specifically to, tied to COVID. It is because of COVID symptoms or uh, exposure. Uh, and it is tied to the governor's emergency declaration related to COVID. Right. And it doesn't necessarily mean it has to happen at work, your, your reason for being sent home. If you have a relative that spent the night and they were tested positive and now you feel you have to quarantine, then it would kick in. Correct. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's no way to track necessarily exactly where someone was exposed. You know, I could get it from my kids who are in daycare and I wouldn't know if I got it from them or if I got it from being in, in the office one day or whatever. So we, we can't tie it directly to the, the source. It's just not not possible medically at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Any other members second round? So Mr. Chair, how about if we proceed then with the motion and uh, Council President Smith, your, your pleasure to, to preliminary today and then uh, also motion for the executive session uh, and the uh, post agenda uh, on Monday. I believe we did already though. That's where I stumbled there. I think we already did motion the post agenda yesterday. Council, uh, Council President Smith. All right, I'm happy to proceed with preliminary vote today if that's the will of the members. Okay. Um, seeing no more comment, all those in favor say aye. 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 Abstain. Aye. In, any opposed? Abstain. One abstention by Councilman Coghill. The was there a second abstention? Okay, one yes, abstention. Sorry, my, sorry, Councilwoman Smith, I had mute. I'm sorry. I'm going to abstain today too. I want to wait till the discussion on um, Monday night. Okay, two abstentions. Um, the bill is recommended. That moves us okay. on to our invoices. We have invoices for approval. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Invoices are approved. That will take us to our Public Safety Services Committee, which is chaired by Mr. O'Connor. Uh, first new papers, Bill 923. Bill 923, resolution authorizing the city's Department of Public Safety to purchase an HP plotter T2600PS printer at a cost not to exceed $12,394. Motion to approve, discussion. Second. Second. Uh, just, is anybody on for this? From public safety? Sir, this is, uh, sorry, sir, this is Lieutenant McCurio from the uh, Intel Intelligence Unit. Uh, I'm here uh, standing by. Okay, uh, can you just explain the printer? Are, are we just getting one and does it do something a little bit different for what is it, twelve thousand dollars? Yes, sir. So it's a it's a printer for uh, it, it's a very large printer uh, utilized to uh, print um, maps and graphs uh, for long scale investigations, and um, it's something that that is uh, you know law enforcement sensitive, so we can't use typical you know printing uh, resources. Okay, yeah, I just, uh, it, it just, I looked these printers up online, it was only a couple hundred dollars. So uh, this one obviously does something a little bit different than what I, I thought a regular printer does. So, um, so this is maps for, sorry, you broke up a little bit. This is maps <coughs> for what again? Yeah, it's maps for long, uh, long term investigations, graphs, uh, things like that, um, you know, resources that that we need to print here uh, that are law enforcement sensitive so we can't utilize, you know, typical um, other resources. 
Okay. Uh, now, obviously, this question isn't for you. It's more of a statement that the council that we had heard from the post agenda that we hosted uh, a couple weeks ago, and even the the um, budget hearing was just, um, I guess, I would say overdoing things that we already have. No, not not to say that this printer isn't needed. That's fine, but um, just some of the utilities that were double spending when it comes to technology, we looked and we thought we could save some funding. So, I mean, something like this is obviously needed. I get that. I just know that we have printers like this across the city and I wonder why we're not just using, I know the printing shop is closed for us right now, but if we can just consolidate some of this stuff, we're gonna save money in certain ways, especially when it comes to technology. Um, and I know that that was brought up at the budget hearing. So that's why I'm mentioning it now. Uh, I have no further questions. I'll pass it off. I know. Somebody else had some questions. Any other members? Uh, Councilwoman Gross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, officer. I am, I'm just doing the same thing that Councilman O'Connor just said he did. And since we're all sitting at computers um, while we were in session on Zoom, I plopped it into a Google search and I came up for like $9,000. Um, and also I have, so in the second part of the question is, um, I got a bunch of emails telling me not to vote for a lie detector equipment. Is this related to this equipment? No, it is not. Okay. So is that a different bill on today's agenda or is it next week's agenda? Do you know? Uh, I'm unfamiliar with that, ma'am. Okay. So I don't think our bill talks about, um, it looks like this has already been costed out with a vendor. Is that true? And can you address the discrepancy between, you know, a general Google purchase, you know, it says like a, you do shopping as a search for on Google and you come up with the, I, I just cut and pasted your exact HP plotter T2600PS in here. And I got, you know, places selling it online for, Eight thousand seven hundred and ninety-five, nine thousand four hundred ninety-five. Um, can you want to speak to why? Why does our bill say exactly twelve thousand three hundred ninety-four? Uh, Councilperson, this is Lee Schmidt, Assistant Director of Public Safety. I'm here with Dan Shack. He can. Uh, we did work with IMP to have this spec and priced out per city Great. contracts, uh, but Dan can ex expand on that a little bit. Appreciate it. Uh, Good morning, members. Uh, as uh, the Assistant Director Schmidt spoke to, um, when we request a piece of technology like this, we start off by going through the Department of Innovation and Performance. Um, it was a, um, this device is being replaced. It's an antiquated device that has stopped functioning. They uh, looked at it. They did a needs assessment on it. They were the ones that uh, worked with Amcom, the printer vendor, provided us the proposal and the quote um, as per the, uh, the current contracts and support. Um, this was the model that was specified. And this was the, the feature set and support that was kind of came behind that. So uh, understand that there are some other ones out there that uh, kind of uh, you may see different variable prices. Um, but this one was the one that was kind of recommended through the Department of Innovation or Performance. So we kind of follow their lead. And, and that's how we ended up with this model of it. As Lieutenant Mercurio said, this is obviously utilized for printing large scale maps uh, you know, of, of incidents, uh, printing types of documentation that is law enforcement sensitive. So it's not like we could just kind of go out to, uh, you know, Kinko's and get them printed off or, you know, kind of use another one at a, another location. Um, a lot of it was for sensitive law enforcement investigations. Um, hopefully that helps clarify it a little bit better. And if I can also speak one sure. additional, uh, the increased cost also, this does include the maintenance for, uh, I believe, three years um, until it syncs up with the overall city com contractor printers. And it's HP, so don't forget to buy a bunch of printer cartridges. <laughs> Just yeah. speaking for personal experience. Well, that's included in the maintenance, so that's that's probably why. They're so expensive, mm -hmm. right? You never know if people have to figure out how to get do the refills and things like that. I mean, I it's bad timing. Clearly, we've been trying to not spend money. Um, it looks like a substantial. It's like you know, as big as a small desk. Right, this kind of thing is what it looks like to me. Maybe I don't know if it's a desktop or if it stand, stands on the floor. It's hard to tell proportions on my on the screen here, but it obviously prints large sheets of paper, right? Um, 
So I understand that we do. That's what we do with our, you know, city planning department and GIS department from council side. But you're saying that you need to basically have a duplicative stuff because you don't want the information to go through many eyes and many hands. So and that as well as this is uh, replacing a piece of equipment that, that we did have um, that had failed um, that we've been utilizing for printing these you know these maps for years. So it is replacing a piece of equipment that uh, that is end of life and, and it failed on us. How long did it last? Um, I'm not sure if uh, Lieutenant Mercurio could uh, you know speak to the other one, but I, I think I seem to remember that we got that um, back in uh, like 2009 around G20 to print a lot of the large maps of uh, the different areas of operation. I'm wondering if it's so if it's like a 10 year asset, is it capitalized? Is this a capital expenditure? Because it doesn't read on the resolution like it is, but it shouldn't it be capitalized if it's a 10 year? I, I would think uh, due to the the length of the contract with AMCOM and, and kind of piggybacking off of that, I'm not familiar with the, the terms of the contract through uh, that INP has with AMCOM. I don't have any objections, but you know, I just, uh, if, if something, we have a lot more capital funds than operating funds. So that's, that's my only question. Appreciate it. That's all I have. Thank you. Any other members for discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill is recommended. That takes us to Bill 924. Bill 924, resolution authorizing the city's Department of Public Safety to enter into relevant agreement to purchase document management software from Power DMS Inc. on an as needed basis at set negotiated prices to be determined over a term of three years. Motion approved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, oh, sorry, Councilwoman Gross. I'm sorry, I've got to ask, what is set negotiated prices? Is that like $10, $10 million, $10,000? Is there anyone to, I don't understand what that is. Uh, Councilperson Gross, this is Lee Schmidt again. Uh, Thank you. We did work with OMB on this and procurement. Um, part of the reason we have this open is for other public safety bureaus to start utilizing this software as well. Um, so basically it will come out for, for police right now, it's $20,000 a year to, for police to utilize it. Uh, we also are uh, in, as you all mentioned earlier and Councilman O'Connor mentioned, um, we're trying to get everybody kind of on the same systems. So by opening this contract up this way, uh, we did work with procurement, which I believe Jen Olsinger is on also to speak to it. Um, it allows us to have fire and EMS and other bureaus within public safety utilize this as necessary, um, obviously with review from our director and the mayor's office. And, um, but it, it, it's a fairly low cost annual s service uh, software. I would, yeah, I would like to just um, have um, Director Olzinger jump in if she wanted, would if she's there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, good morning, Council. Um, Jennifer Olzinger, Assistant Director, Office of Management and Budget and Procurement Manager for the City. Um, yes, what so I'd this like to hear is that this is not only going to increase efficiency and people's daily frustration. Trust me, we're all managing documents digitally now, right? If, I'll just, just say, if you see my office downtown where I haven't been, you know it's piled sky high with paper and I can't get any of them right now. <laughs> so I understand that we all need to manage documents digitally. It's actually kind of better for our archiving, especially now that we have our archivist at city council who's given guidance to departments. It's especially important for public safety and, and police especially to have good dependable, right? Legally dependable document management. But I would also love to hear that you're actually gonna save us money. Can you speak to that a little bit? Um, I cannot speak to the saving of the money, but I would imagine that, um, you know, the more uh, the bureaus that are able to go paperless and share information electronically, um, you know, that just naturally inherently um, saves paper, saves printing costs, um, you know, inner office mail resources of people getting documents back and forth. So that's just something I think that just kind of happens naturally when when you go electronic with with any sort of document management and obviously having public safety all on the same database, um, you know, is just going to be much more efficient. Um, the pricing on this why it's open ended 
um, because we don't know what our exact need is. Um, and it's going to be a per user kind of basis per um, public safety agency. Um, and uh, normally this is something that we would probably do as a low bid agreement, but because uh, this is a proprietary system, something we already use, uh, we did a waiver of the competitive process. So uh, this is more like a commodity um, waiver rather than normally most of the waivers you see are professional services that have a set amount, a set deliverable, but because this is an unknown and we're not sure which department is going to purchase and when they're going to purchase and what budget it's going to be from, that is why we're leaving that information very open-ended at this time. I hope that- It's a little uncomfortably open-ended given that you're waiving the RFP process. And um, so you're, it's, you know, kind of how is this, where's the transparency and accountability? Right? Um, this is a continuation of services waiver because we are already using this service uh, and we don't want to change systems. So um, if you would do an RFP, that would, you know, okay. say to the public, we're looking to, um, you know, to for other options that we're looking to change. Um, and honestly, the cost of changing systems uh, would it's much bigger. that. God knows so if I'm anyone's ever switched softwares. Got mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So I, okay. That gives me a lot better information. You can, you can understand how it was really kind of looked non-competitive and, and with the, especially not talking about dollar amounts. Um, I'm glad you're able to clarify that. That's all the questions that I have. I'm supportive. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anything else from members? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Uh, that takes us to our Public Works Committee, which is chaired by Councilman Coghill. Uh, one new paper, Bill 916. Bill 916, resolution granting unto RCH Pittsburgh LLC, their successors and assigns the privilege and license to construct, maintain, and use of their own cost and expense to install two new entrance canopy at 3234 Liberty Avenue in the 6th Ward, 7th Council District. You're on mute, Councilman Cockhill. I'm sorry. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Bill is recommended. That takes us to Land Use and Economic Development Committee, which is chaired by Councilman Wilson. Um, first new paper, Bill 926. Bill 926, resolution approving a conditional use application under the Pittsburgh Code, Title IX, Zone and Article 4, Chapter 910, to a Meyer, Unkovich, and Scott on behalf of 429 Forbes for the transfer of development rights involving 87 dwelling units from 201 Stanwick Street, Golden Triangle Subdistrict B, to 429 Forbes Avenue Zone, GTB, Golden Triangle Subdistrict B. First Ward, Council District Number Six. Motion to hold for cable cast public hearing. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We will be held for a public hearing. That takes us to our Innovation, Performance, and Asset Management Committee, which is chaired by Councilman Strasburger. Um, first, the third paper is Bill Five Twenty One. Bill Five Twenty One, Resolution Repealing. Amending and reenacting resolution number 18 of 1983, effective January 20th, 1983, titled Resolution Authorizing and Directing that the Bureau of Cable Communications, Department of Public Works, broadcast all of Council's regular legislative sessions, standing committee meetings, setting forth the responsibility of the Department of Innovation and Performance with respect to meetings of City Council and to reflect various changes in the city's departmental organization structure and other changes to reflect, to reflect technological innovations since 1983. Motion to approve a discussion. I'll defer to the bill sponsor. Motion to hold eight weeks. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Bill will be held eight weeks. Bill 906. Bill 906, resolution authorizing the mayor and director of the Department of Innovation and Performance to enter into a professional services agreement with ERP One Consulting Inc. for a term of three years 
plus two one-year options for the provision of today of the day-to-day -day managed services of the city JDE Edwards Enterprise One 9.2 application, currently managed by the Allegheny County Service Center at a cost not to exceed $650,000 over five years. Motion to approve with discussion. Second. Second. So I have a, an amendment that I would like to vote on and I'm happy to make a motion to amend, vote on that and then get into the substance of the bill if that is okay um, with everybody. Uh, the amendment was sent oh, out today at nine, about 9 a.m. Um, accompanied the agenda. It really just is technical in nature. It changes the term of the agreement from three years plus two one-year options to one year plus three one-year renewal options and from 650,000 over five years to 550,000 over four years. That's the gist of it. Gotcha. Heidi, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I think that's correct. I'll correct. second the motion to amend. Okay, okay, thank you. Any any discussion on the amendment? All those in favor to amend, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The bill is amended. Any discussion on the amended bill? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The aye. bill is now recommended. That takes us to Intergovernmental Affairs Committee, chaired by Councilwoman Gross. We have one deferred paper, Bill 192. Bill 192, resolution adopting plan revision to the City of Pittsburgh's official sewer facilities plan for the villas at Winter Park and Hackstown Street Extended. Motion to approve a discussion. Second. Second brief discussion. Yes, thank you, Councilman. Thank you. I apologize. I should have caught this mm -hmm. one. Uh, could I please ask you to motion to hold for um, eight weeks? Uh, motion to hold eight weeks. And I'll second it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill is held eight weeks. Uh, new papers, Bill 917. Bill 917. Resolution authorizing the URA to acquire all the city's right, title, and interest, if any, in and to the following publicly owned properties in the 10th ward of the city, designated in the D Registry Office of Allegheny County, located at 424 North Matilda Street, 4938 and 5120 Rosetta Street, 4921 and 5001 Broad Street, respectively, Council District 9. Motion to approve discussion. Second. Councilman Burgess, do you want to say anything about the project? No, I'm good. Thank you. Know about it. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Bill 918. Yeah. Bill 918, resolution appointing execution of a contract for this position by sale of land between the URA and 2P1TN Cares Inc. or a related entity to be formed for the sale of lot one in the Project Cares Consolidated Plan, currently being a portion of block 2P lot 110, all of block 2P lot 120, and a to be vacated stretch of Old First Avenue adjourning such parcels to the south in the first ward of the city, Council District 6. Motion to approve a discussion. Second. Second. Mr. Lavelle, do you want to say anything about this project? <coughs> sure. This is the um, homeless shelter um, that is being built down on First Avenue, and we must uh, vacate a portion of this in order for it to move forward. This was voted on last month at the URA's board meeting. Appreciate it. We're all looking forward to that project, I think. Thank you. Uh, quick question. Councilman, is this the one related to the PNC uh, funding? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Bill is recommended. Bill 919. Bill 919, resolution authorizing the URA to acquire all the city's right, title, and interest, if any, in and to the following publicly owned properties in the 13th ward of the city designated in the deed registry office of Allegheny County as block 175H, lot 49, located at 7907 Susquehanna Street, Council District 9. 
Motion to approve a discussion. Second. Second. Uh, again, um, I see the arrays on the line. Is there some discussion? Anyone have questions? Or Councilman Burgess, do you want to give us a summary? I'm good. It's a it's a program to buy um, abandoned buildings, rehab them, um, and provide them for housing. It's wonderful. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill is recommended. Our last bill, Bill 920. Bill 920, resolution authorizing the mayor and chief equity officer to enter into a professional services agreement with Sister Cities Association of Pittsburgh as a single source provider to manage the city's relationships and programming with its sister cities and develop new partnerships with cities throughout the world at a cost not to exceed $25,000. Motion to approve a discussion. Second. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, we have some, uh, the executive director of the Sister Cities program with us, I think Kathy Briscoe. Kathy, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Would you like to turn on your camera and join us? Um, you can, you don't have to turn on your camera if you don't want to. <laughs> no, I, I'm, <laughs> happy to, but, do. I'm happy to, but it says I cannot start my video because the host stopped it. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Feiner, you can help us with that. Kathy, while we're talking, hey. there you are. Um, uh, full disclosure, I've known Kathy for a very long time, but congratulations at your new position and um, for the mayor's office for uh, encouraging the creation, I, it was the way I understand it, of this nonprofit independent organization that is working to expand our sister cities programs. But maybe I should ask you to summarize it. That's how I understood it. And I see Mr. Marenstein's on the line as well, but um, Kathy, why don't you give us uh, just a summary, because it may be new for members or some members of the public, for sure. Sure, happy to. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak to you today. Um, the Sister Cities Association of Pittsburgh is an independent uh, nonprofit organization that was formed uh, early last year um, by a board of directors that is uh, led by Jim Wolf, who was asked by the mayor um, back in 2017 to resurrect the city of Pittsburgh Sister Cities program. Um, Many of you might know we've had a sister, our city has had, has had a sister cities program since the 1950s, and we have 20 sister cities at this point in time. Um, to be fair, not all 20 sister cities are active at this moment. Um, I would say five are active. Um, those include Bilbao, Spain, Satima City, Japan, which is adjacent to Tokyo, Sofia, Bulgaria, uh, Wuhan, China, Da Nang, Vietnam, and most recently, we signed a, a new sister cities agreement with Glasgow, Scotland, um, late last month. Um, the, 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 the goal of the sister cities program is to connect the Pittsburgh region with international city partners to develop mutually beneficial relationships in the areas of commerce, education, and culture, and to work together to address and solve global challenges facing the cities of tomorrow. We, um, we, <laughs> we, what we've done, or what I've done since I came into this role in May, is to uh, reinvigorate some of those sister cities relationships that the city has, as well as uh, develop a rubric to determine how new sister cities we might want to add um, to our portfolio, as well as figure out how to resurrect the sister cities relationships that we already have. And when we look at that rubric that I put together, it looks for things like similarity to the Pittsburgh region. Do, they have, do these cities have a commitment to sustainability? Are they a smart city or do they have a goal to become one? Uh, do they have a growing and expanding economy? Do they have a vibrant technology sector? Is the level of engagement, um, is there good synergy? Is it reciprocal? Um, and then we look at the impact of engagement. Is it financial, is it cultural, is it educational, is it symbolic? And then importantly, we measure the importance of these relationships, right? So I can come back to you and I can come back to other funders and say, this is what our region has gained by sistering with, with this city. Um, so we were using very, very clear um, um, objectives and, and measurable um, uh, items to be able to come back to you and say, this is what, this is what we've, we've accomplished by sistering with these cities. Does anybody have any questions for me? I'm happy to go more in depth, but I don't want to take too much of your time. Sorry, I still have the floor, but I see um, and the chair will, will ask other members if they have comments. Mr. Marenstein, I wanted to also see um, if you had a kind of anything to add, a 
kind of to give an overview. What I just heard was, and I hadn't thought about before, I'd always thought about sister cities being cities similar to us, but it, you know, do we all also have an affordability uh, problem around housing or are we similarly post-industrial cities or are we similarly kind of new technology cities? But what I also heard there, and maybe it was just me, that maybe we also are looking for partnerships for cities that complement us. Right. If we have needs for things that they have, whether that's cultural needs or um, solutions. Um, so and that's that kind of opens up the realm of possibility about what we understand as deliverables. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. I didn't know if you want to add something there. I think uh, Kathy covered um, Hirsch Merenstein from the mayor's office. Um, Kathy covered it really well. I think um, another goal of the program is to also you know, learn, as Councilwoman Grosh just alluded to, about you know, addressing uh, shared issues like climate change. And I know that was a big part of uh, the partnership with Glasgow that Kathy uh, assisted with um, and her organization assisted with. So absolutely, I think it's sort of taking on a new meaning um, and it's something that's very um, near and dear to the mayor's heart. I'd also like to add one more thing. Sorry, Deb, um, our Councilwoman Gross. <laughs> um, <laughs> Director uh, Risco, please. <laughs> so um, uh, one of the things that we're also doing is we are creating a work plan for every sister city between um, what we want to accomplish um, here in, in the Pittsburgh region and what that city wants to accomplish as well. I'm happy to share with you the work plan that we've put together for Glasgow. and. You know, it's, it's a wide range of things. We look at things like workforce development. We look at the circular economy. We're looking at climate change. We're looking at um, social housing. We're looking at, at, at all of these different things that are happening in that city and what can we learn from that city and bring to our region. Um, and the, the work plan also includes work groups who are going to be implementing this. And it's not just um, my board or me, but it, and, or it's, it's, people who work for the city, it's people who work for nonprofit organizations. So we're bringing the right people together to have these conversations, to be able to transfer this learning. Um, and you know, one of the exciting things about Glasgow, and this just came up during kind of normal conversations I've been having with my, with my counterparts in Glasgow is they're really excited about possibly establishing um, a Warhol uh, museum in Glasgow. And so we've already brought the leadership of the Carnegie museum together with the leadership of Glasgow Life on a Zoom call two weeks ago to talk about what is the potential for that. Um, we will be signing the, uh, we had a virtual signing ceremony for Glasgow, but we will be signing, um, physically signing the agreement at COP26 uh, next, um, hopefully next year in November in Glasgow, which is the UN Climate Change um, conference. So it's also, um, they've also invited me to speak to talk about the importance of these international sister cities relationships. So it's really, it's a very exciting thing for Pittsburgh to, to be able to, to stand up on a world stage and say, this is how we're addressing some of these issues and we're doing it in partnership with cities that are, that are like us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all I have for now. Thank you. First hand I saw was Councilman O'Connor. Uh, thank you. I just have one question. Kathy, I know you guys do a lot of good work. Um, this is more for uh, Hirsch, if we can find this out. Um, I see in our budget, we have the Office of Equity Special Initiatives Manager supposed to be managing uh, sister cities. Uh, it's part of their job for $72,000. Um, so what is that person doing that we need to spend. And look, I, Kathy, I, I think giving them money is great. So Kathy, don't take this out on you, but just we're, we're somebody is making $72,000 and yet we're still paying out an extra $25,000. So if we can find out who that person is and what they do, um, that would be kind of helpful um, just because it's in the budget and I just don't want to duplicate services because we just talked about that in public safety as well. But if anything, I'd just get rid of the position and give more money to Kathy's organization. Um, so that's kind of where at first you can get me that answer as to who that individual is, it is and why they're not doing their job. Uh, that would be uh, helpful, but I'm supportive. So talk I, to you I can speak briefly to that and I, then I can follow up with uh, the councilman offline as well. Um, the special initiative manager does have a number of um, responsibilities under her um, uh, position, including census work, welcoming Pittsburgh uh, initiatives. So she manages those two 
initiatives in addition to um, to other responsibilities. Um, and she, you know, she is an active member of the mayor's office. Um, but we think Kathy's organization is uniquely positioned to to, to really assist in expanding the program. Uh, in addition, but I, I will absolutely follow up with you uh, offline too, Councilman. All right, thank you. Thank you. Other members, Councilman Coghill. Yes, <clears throat> thanks, Kathy, and thanks for being here. Um, I just, I guess, a uh, couple questions. First of all, I want to say I remember when the folks came from Tokyo. Um, you know, really nice affair. I still have the little present they gave me, a little dish on my uh, on my desk, and and I love that about what you do. I love the networking, I guess, and really that is the gist of it, right? We're really networking and hoping to learn from whether it be from their economy and same issues, same problems that these sister cities would have. Is is that fair to say? So, um, I, yes, it's very fair to say, and that's only part of it. Um, so like another example of like the economic opportunities for our region is um, I have a, our organization, the Sister Cities Association of Pittsburgh has a very, very strong relationship with the Pittsburgh Technology Council. And so I've been meeting with a number of technology companies in our region who have interests in doing business overseas in, our, in some of our sister cities. And likewise, um, you know, a really good example is Da Nang um, is really interested in learning how we have revitalized our riverfronts. So, you know, putting them in touch with and getting them to meet with the people from River Life, right, to talk about, you know, the tactics that we've taken. Um, those are examples of, of, of international exchanges that could lead to bolstering our economy here and helping to bolster the economy in the, in the, in the, in the sister city as well. So um, right now um, we are in having conversations with Doha, Qatar, who is not a sister city, but they have great interest in Pittsburgh and they're incredibly interested in our technology sector. Um, so I have been pairing up, um, you know, uh, mainly robotics companies, because that's what their interest is, um, with the uh, Qatari Financial Center to learn if there are synergies there for some of our, our businesses to, to be able to expand their businesses. So that would help our economy as well. Yeah, and for that reason, Kathy, uh, even though we really can't put a dollar on the amount of you know benefits that we get from it, it's really information sharing. Um, and that was my next question really was, is there any trade? Meaning, you know, maybe we could uh, send Heinz ketchup to Tokyo. Is there any of that, <laughs> that talk with these sister cities? I mean, everything's on the table. So if that is something that is of great interest, then yes, definitely. Um, you know, one company that actually um, ha is doing business in, in Japan, in Satama City, is Gecko Robotics. And uh, they are local here. And they got a contract to, to work with the city of Satama um, to help line their pipes. I'm not exactly into it. it it's, it's, right. it's a robot that goes into pipes to look at them. Right. I'm, I'm not exactly sure of all the technology, but, but that's, that's a, an example of, and they can't, when, when the delegation came here, was it last year or maybe the, the year before? Time is difficult now, but um, they met with Gecko and that started the whole conversation. So there, there are some metrics we can put to that, but that's also something that I'm trying to do is to ensure, you know, to, to put as many metrics to this as possible, to be able to, like I said, come back to you um, and to other funders and say, this is what this equated. This is what this relationship has, begot, has, has gotten our region. Yeah, Kathy. And, you know, I think it's going to be hard to put a, you know, um, a, a line item on what it meant to us for, you know, developing these relationships. But I think it means a lot of things, just like you talk about robotics. I know Councilwoman Gross's district is, you know, filled with robotics now. And that's really good to hear. So you really can't put a price tag on what you do, I feel. So I'm not looking for an economic gain as to what you do. But I think that that just comes about just by the nature of it and information, I guess. And finally, I wanted to ask you, is Andy Warhol Scottish? Is that why the Scotch are so... So no, he is, he was, um, uh, why can't I think? He was Polish? Was Ukrainian or it Ukrainian? Was like, yeah. What the, um, yeah. Oddly enough, we do have a sister city in, um, in, uh, in, in the country where he was born. Yeah. Yeah. And in, we have one in Croatia and we have one in, in Ukraine. So whichever it is. Um, but no, there's just a, there's a very strong interest in war, in, in Warhol in, in Glasgow. So it's- uh, yeah, I, I love it's, to hear that. I really do. I think he's our most international product. We could talk it is, about it, 
the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Penguins, but Andy yeah. Warhol or Warhol, I guess was his original name. He's really yeah. our, our best international product, I guess. And, it's um, interesting because that's, that's exciting. There's going to be something at part of COP26 in November in Glasgow next year that is going to have a Warholian because they are doing um, they're doing shoulder events, right, cultural shoulder events around the conference. So that could also, um, you know, the whole relationship between Pittsburgh and Glasgow and Warhol could have a, a major stage, international stage in, in a year. So that's exciting. Well, that sounds great, Kathy. And it sounds like you do good work. I'm in full support. And I look forward to maybe, uh, maybe we'll go visit somewhere someday. Yep, some definitely. City. definitely. Bring Thank it. You. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilman Wilson. Yes. Uh, hi. You know, as a new as a new councilman, I just had a question of um, how would you suggest that we measure the the partner the funding this partnership versus Connect? Uh, um, I don't know if you know, but I was the former executive director of Connect. <laughs> I was the first executive director of Connect, so actually I can talk about this very. <laughs> Um, so, you know, Connect is obviously an intergovernmental cooperation. What Connect brings to the city of Pittsburgh is strengthened relationships with your neighboring municipalities and opportunities to do things like um, when I was the ED, we did joint purchasing with the city to do LED streetlights because smaller municipalities don't have the, 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 the buying power that the city does. But together, we, we obviously um, were stronger. Um, Sister Cities is a little bit different, obviously, because we're talking about international relationships and, um, and, and, you know, it's still about fostering relationships and it, it's similar um, to what you're doing with Connect, just kind of on a larger stage. Um, and I think that there's also interesting learnings that you can get from these sorts of conversations with international partners that you might not necessarily get with somebody who's, you know, hyper local, right? So um, the opportunity to really learn about um, what another city is doing to address, um, you know, um, social inequities in their community, right, is, is unique because it, you know, with Connect, it's, it's, you know, you're talking about what's going on in Aetna versus what's going on in Wilkinsburg versus what's going on in Pittsburgh, right? Um, but this is, this is a little bit different. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious as we see the proposed budget and, and some of the memberships that were being left out, just... You know, curious on how you would suggest that we measure this this membership moving forward. Yeah, I you know, I, I think I think also, you know, when when you talk about connect, you're talking about shared sewer policy, right? What are we gonna do about, you know, preventing um uh you know stormwater from going into our system so that it doesn't overtax our sewer system, right? Um, we could still ask those same questions about how is Glasgow dealing with, with you know, sewer infrastructure issues. I mean, the ages of cities, if they're similar, they're dealing with crumbling infrastructure and how to fund it and how to fix it, right? So we could learn a lot from them. You know, there, there might be unique mechanisms that, are, that, that, that could be applied here. Okay. All right, thanks. Thank you. Any further members? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. May I, I, may, Mr. Chair, may I just qualify two things? First of all, I just looked it up in Andy Warhol, Slovakian, which is not the former Yugoslavia nor Ukraine, <laughs> but part of the former Czechoslovakia, and um, that we don't make Heinz ketchup here anymore. <laughs> is that right? None. No, it's not made here at all, unfortunately. Sorry, I just interjected. Apologize. We do have a Slovakian sister city. We'll, we'll send them pickles, whatever. <laughs> we'll make something. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill is recommended. And that does exhaust our agenda <clears throat> for today, excuse me. Um, we do have a number of meeting announcements. Council's budget hearings will continue this afternoon at 1.30 with the Department of Finance and the Department of Law, including the Ethics Board, chaired by myself. Um, council budget hearings are also scheduled for tomorrow, Thursday, December 3rd at 10 a.m. with the Department of Public Works, which is chaired by Councilman Coghill. Also tomorrow at 1.30, Council will hold a budget hearing with the Department of Parks and Recreation, which is chaired by Councilman Burgess. Please keep in mind that public comment is not taken at budget hearings, but residents are free to register for upcoming weekly council meetings and the citizen participation hearing on December 14th. 
Next week, council will hold their regular and standing committees meeting on Tuesday, December 8th and Wednesday, December 9th, respectively, both at 10 a.m. To register to speak at next week's council meetings, please call the clerk's office at 412-255-2138 before 9 a.m. Tuesday and Wednesday or email comments to city clerk's office at pittsburghpa.gov. Is there any other announcements from members? Mr. Chair. Councilwoman Strasburger. I just had two, um, two things I wanted to clarify. One is um, I had to step away from my, from my screen for a moment. I wanted to register an I vote for Bill 927. And I was hoping to change my vote for the invoices to abstain. Duly noted. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Anything else for members? If not, motion to approve the minutes and adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned.